All right. Thank you, Art, for leading us in that time of prayer. And I'm excited for everyone. We're continuing in our new sermon series here at Lakeshore. Basic training. If you're coming for the first time, we're glad to have you with us. And why we're doing this sermon series is there is a deep need in the Western church to go back to the fundamentals. right? In our Christian faith, right? as we look at different aspects of it, as we look at different topics, all of those extra things are really based on the assumption that you have the foundations right. Like for, for example, if you don't have a right belief in the person of Jesus, well, that's the first thing, right? Everything else above that is secondary comparison to that. So we need to get these core fundamental teachings right. And more than just being intellectual head knowledge, we need to live in the reality of these things. Not just know it, but to actually practically walk it out. So last Sunday, we looked at the most important thing. Chris, if you could turn me down a little bit. We looked at the person of Jesus. And if you weren't able to watch that message, it's on our YouTube channel, it's on our Facebook page. I'd love for you to check that out if you weren't able to watch it. But today we're looking at probably this, I like to call the second most important thing. And that is who we are in Jesus, our identity in Christ. We're, we're called a lot of things in Scripture, right? And, and actually, it goes against a lot of the things we call ourselves. One thing that's very common in Christian circles, right, is I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And again, we can look at the semantics of that, and that's kind of technically true, but often it's missing the point. You're so much more than just a sinner now in Christ. You are now what's called holy. You're a new people. You are a holy nation. You're a righteous people. You're called priests. You are all sorts of things in Jesus, right? You now have all sorts of new identity statements. And with that identity, you have spiritual blessings, of which we're going to look at a few of today. In the, in the 19th century, there was a man named John Newton. John Newton. And he had a life that was very far from God. In fact, it was probably as far from God as you could get. He was a slave trader. He was a slave trader, and he was renowned for his brutality and his disregard for human life. One day at sea, during a violent storm, he experienced a dramatic conversion where he truly gave his life over to Jesus. He cried out to God. He cried out for mercy, and he cried out for forgiveness. And it was in that moment of desperation that he truly found his new identity in Jesus Christ. And what did he do, right? Did he continue in his old way of life? Absolutely not. He 180. He turned completely away from it. He now devoted himself to God. He became a minister. He became a hymn writer. In fact, he's known for the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, right? We all know that song. But think about that. A, 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 an old slave trader wrote that song, right? Because he wasn't a slave trader anymore. He wasn't an evil man anymore. He was now a son of God. He was now holy in Jesus Christ. So how did he experience such a radical shift in his identity, right? Where he goes from over here being a slave trader to over here writing one of the most iconic songs of the Christian faith that all of us sing to this day, even though we kind of put new spins on it. And it's because he understood his identity in Christ. He understood it and he walked in it. You too can experience a huge change in your life. One thing I see in many Christians is, you know, we, we experience this conversion, we believe in Jesus now, we, you know, we read these things in God's Word about us, but we may lack some practical change in our life. Maybe we feel like the same old people. Maybe we do the same old things, right? And often I think that comes from two things, right? It comes from lack of knowledge, right? We just don't know the things about God's Word because we're not spending time in it. And second, we're not applying, we're not living out the things in God's Word, right? We need to know it and then we need to show it. We've got to live it out. And so this morning, we're going to be doing both of those things. We're going to be knowing all of these new spiritual blessings that are based in our, our new identity in Christ. And we're also going to be learning how to actually live this out. My hope for you is that you live like new people. I don't want you just to know that you're a new person in Christ. I want you to live like it. And wouldn't that be amazing, right? If Sutton, if this town saw us live differently, 
saw us live radically different than other people. What would happen if we actually walked in that? And I, I think we would see a transformation in this town. So let's dive into this together. Our new identity in Christ. And we're going to be breaking down Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 14, but we're going to be doing it in chunks as we go together. So if you have your Bibles with you, even if you have your phone Bible, please open that up. Most of you have phones, I think. So if you have that, please open up God's Word. We'll also have it on the screen, but better to have it in front of you. All right, Ephesians 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. All right. So the first thing we see here that stands out in the text, and this is actually the perfect, Chris, you're already there. The blessings of God, right? This stands out, especially uh, in verses 3 and 4, right? We're, we're talked about how we're blessed. We've received blessings in God, right? And often we miss the power of this word, right? Like, when do most of us say blessed or bless you, right? When someone sneezes. We don't really use it as a very intimate word meaning a lot, right? It's kind of like, a, you, know, you know, blessings, bless you, hope you feel better. No, we don't, it doesn't mean a lot to us, but this means a lot in God's word when it talks about God's actions. When God blesses, it always involves action. It means something happens. Something very practical and powerful happens. And that is, when God blesses you, it means His power is now released into you for your good. It's not just God saying something. It's Him practically doing something. It's His power impacting you. And every specific blessing mentioned originates with God, right? It originates with him, and it goes out to you. And these blessings are spiritual as opposed to physical, right? God has not blessed you with lots of money or with eternal health or all of that stuff. He's given us something better. And you might be asking, well, what could be better than like a billion dollars, right, or, or health? And the problem is we have a very worldly line of thinking, right, where we're thinking about the here and now. But the things of this world aren't that great, and they don't last. In the, in the early 1930s, I guess 1920s and 1930s, there was a huge shift that had happened in Germany. Right After, after World War I and all of the, the sanctions and the punishments that were now on Germany as a nation, what happened was their currency essentially became worthless within a short period of time. You know, there were stories of, of people basically overturning wheelbarrows full of money to leave the money and to steal the wheelbarrow because the, the wheelbarrow was worth more, was actually more, is worth more than the money was. The things of this world can change, right? Money can, can become worthless. It can go away. Health, it can change on a dime, right? The things of this world are really not what we want. What we want are things that don't change, things that have lasting power. And that is where God has blessed us. He's given us spiritual blessings. That doesn't make the blessing more real. It actually makes it, it doesn't make the blessing less real. It makes it more real that there's spiritual blessings. These blessings actually occur in the spiritual realm. And in ancient times, they believed that there were different realms, right? And the highest realm was the spiritual realm. That's where God was. And one of the lowest realms were, well, that's the physical realm. That's where we were. You know, people in ancient times, they didn't just want to stay in the physical realm or have things better in the physical realm. They wanted to be in the spiritual realm. They wanted to be where things are better. And even though that's not exactly a biblical way of thinking, it is based in some truth that we don't want to just stay here, right? We want to go somewhere where things are better, where things are eternal, where things are truly uh, pleasurable and happy, right? Right? You are blessed not only in the highest realm of existence, the spiritual realm where God is, but the experience of all of those blessings that you have will occur there. 
In Ephesians 2, 6, it says that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Right? That these, these blessings occur now and they occur in the spiritual realm. They are a spiritual reality. And we also see that these blessings, right, all of these things you've now received when you've given your life over to Christ, they occur, they happen in Jesus. And this is a weird statement, right, that all of these blessings are in Jesus. What does this actually mean? What we have to understand is that every single person born today, all of us included, before we gave our life to, life to Christ, we were over here in what's called in Adam. What that means is Adam, right, who is kind of the, the, the first man, the founder of the human race, right, that when he fell, when he sinned, all of us sinned. All of us fell with Adam. And so now in Adam, we're fallen. We're sinful. We experience death. We have pain. We have sorrow. All of that is our reality in Adam. doesn't matter if we like it. It's just our reality, right? We're in Adam. It's like an identity statement. But when we've given our life over to Christ, we now kind of segue over here and we join a new family tree. And now we're not in Adam anymore. Even though we're still human beings, even though at least for now we still get sick, we'll still die, we are now part of a new family tree where sin doesn't identify us anymore. But now righteousness identifies us. And just like how in the old family tree it was all about being in Adam, what Adam did, his sin is your sin, this new family tree is all about what Christ did. His righteousness is your righteousness. His perfect life is your perfect life. His sacrifice on the cross was for you. His death was for you. Right? And so now all of the spiritual blessings that are true of Jesus are also true of you. Now why does this matter? Well, does anyone here still maybe mess up with sin sometimes? Everyone should have their hands up. You're lying. Everyone does, right? If all the spiritual blessings were in us, we would lose them in seconds. We'd lose them in seconds, right? We're all, we, we should be happy the spiritual blessings are not in us because if they were, we wouldn't be blessed for very long. But they're in Christ, which means they can never be taken away because Jesus' perfect life does not just start being unperfect, right? His sacrifice doesn't just go away based on things you do. It's eternal. It's there forever. In, God, in, in Christ, we now have a new relationship with God, one that severs our relationship to Adam and establishes a new relationship that can never be taken away. And, and, and what this means is that these blessings you have are forever. They can't be taken away. Your sin doesn't throw them away, doesn't disregard them. They are there. You already have them when you became a Christian. But here's the thing about these blessings is even though we have them, often for many of us, they're what's called not realized. Not realized. And what this means is you haven't fully experienced them yet. They're there, but you're, you're living as if it's not true. It, it would be as if someone deposited like a billion dollars in your bank account, and yet you're still kind of living month to month as if you're broke. Right? You're living as if you don't have that thing you do actually have. So just because it doesn't feel like it sometimes does not mean these spiritual blessings are not true. You know, for example, I became a father at conception. Life starts at conception. But did I feel like a dad? Was I doing dad things? No. But as my kids have grown, I've grown as a father. It's more realized. It's more experienced. And the same is with our spiritual blessings, right? All of these things we're about to go through are true of you, but you may not have fully experienced them yet or have them fully realized in your life yet. And that's what we want. We want you to experience these blessings and see them fully realized. So now that we know we are blessed, what are these blessings? What actually are they? And we're going to look at the first one in Ephesians 1, 4 to 6. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace in, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The first blessing, and perfect, Chris, you're, you're already ahead of me. The first blessing we're going to look at is the blessing of adoption. The blessing of adoption. And the word it uses, right, 
is that he predestined us for adoption. Now, this is not a word you use a lot, right? It's more of a Christian word. And what this mean, this word means is to plan something beforehand. God's plan is to make you his own child. And this plan is rooted in his sacrificial, unconditional love, reminding you that this work, this blessing, is not based on you deserving it, but based on God's unconditional love for you. And this makes God even more praiseworthy for us, right? Because he blessed us with, with adoption when we were still wicked. When you were not following God, when you wanted nothing to do with him, when you were living your own life, God loved you. And he knew at that moment you were going to be his child, right? So not while you repented, not while you were doing all sorts of good things, it's while you were still evil. That's how much he loves you. In Romans 5.8, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And God's love goes far beyond just pardoning you. We're going to look at forgiveness, but it goes far beyond just forgiving you. His love goes the full distance to adopting you. In, in ancient Roman times, when you adopted someone, it meant that they were your full child. They may as well have been your biological child. There was no difference between that adopted child and your biological child. All the benefits associated with being a biological child were now true of the adopted child as well. This means that when we are adopted children, right, adopted into the family of God, you share fully in all of the benefits associated with Christ's sonship. And we're going to go through a few of these benefits that you now have, right, that you now have in Christ. You share the son's likeness. You share Jesus' likeness. Now, what does this mean? It means that you are now starting to look like him, not physically, but in terms of your actions. Over time, you're going to start living the way Jesus did, right? In Romans 8, 29, conformed into the likeness of his son. Now, this is something that, again, can take time, and really, you realize it when you look back, right? When you look over the trajectory of your Christian life, and you maybe see how much your life has changed, that maybe you were living a certain way, but you don't do that anymore. Or maybe you were known for being a certain type of person, right? Angry, bitter, unforgiving, and now you're not that anymore. Right? Your life starts to change, right? And it's not us just wanting to be better people. It's the Holy Spirit inside of you changing you to now look more like his son. So you start sharing Jesus' likeness. Second, you share the son's privileges. Just like Jesus had intimate access uh, to, to God the Father, to experience His love, experience His for acceptance, His goodness, provision, presence. You now have that same access. In Hebrews 4.16, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. And we really need to reflect on this for a second, right? Apart from Jesus, no one has had this access to God before, ever. Not all of his angels, right? All, all of the angels, right? When you think of even the archangels, none of them had this level, level of access, right? They had power, they had proximity to God, but they weren't his children. You are now elevated to a position that only Christ previously had held. That is a huge privilege, right? Like, imagine if, I always say, you know, rest in peace, I was always gonna, I, I'm always about to say Queen Elizabeth, right? But King Charles, imagine if King Charles adopted you, right? And now you're his son, right, with, with William and Harry, and you benefit, you get all those benefits, right? What we have in our adoption is real, right? And it's real in a much more powerful way than just human kingdoms. Next, another benefit of being adopted is we share the son's inheritance, right? What's an inheritance, right? Well, it's essentially, it's, it's all that is passed on to you when you know, the, the parents pass away, right? But it's different with God, because God's not going anywhere. He's not dying. But everything the Son has, we share in. We have too. In Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we also may be glorified with Him. Everything Christ gets, you get too. It almost seems too good to be true. When Christ comes again, 
and He is glorified, when He is King over all of the earth, when the enemy is defeated, when His kingdom is established forever, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to be established forever. When there is now a new heaven and a new earth, you will share in all of that as co-heir with Christ. Like, think about that. That is real. That is going to happen. That's not going to be taken away once you're in Christ. That's going to happen. And why did God do this for you? All of these things, why did he do it for you? Is it because you're a good person? Is it because you deserved it? Absolutely not. He did it so that you would praise him, so that you would glorify him, so that you would look at all of that and you would say, praise you, God. Thank you. Thank you. You're so good. Your love is so amazing. But that's not the only blessing we have. This is one of them. The next blessing we look at is God's redemption and forgiveness. And we're going to see that in Ephesians 1, verses 7 to 9. It reads this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which he set forth in Christ. All right. So the blessing of redemption and forgiveness. And these two words are hugely significant in the Christian faith. And often we don't always know what they mean. Redemption's context was slavery. In, in biblical times, I guess even today, slavery was very common in biblical times, and it still exists today. But a slave could be set free in biblical times by payment of an agreed-upon price. When this price was given, when the payment was received, the slave was set free or was redeemed. Forgiveness as well also has, a, has maybe another meaning that we often miss, right? Forgiveness means to free or pardon by payment of a price. This is usually in reference to debt, right? The redemption, the forgiveness we receive is in relation to our sin. And this is why the background of slavery and the background of debt is so important to understanding our sin, because they describe perfectly the effect sin has on your life. You are a slave in sin, and you are so, so in debt in sin. So we have to understand that meaning. And Jesus said, Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. He says that in John 8. And the litmus test for this is, you know, think about it, try not to sin for a whole day. I remember when I was a child, and my, my dad's a pastor, and he was explaining this to me. I remember me and him would sit in the hot tub, and he would ask me, like, can you go a whole hour without sinning? I was like, absolutely, I can. And he's like, that's pride. And it's like, I was one second into it, and I sinned, right? You can't do it, right? You will sin. You will sin, whatever it is, whether it's a, a thought, whether it's an action, whether all your kids are screaming and you get mad at them, I'm guilty of that, right? You will sin. We can't not do it. We're slaves to it, right? Jesus tells us that. All people are slaves to sin in three different aspects we're going to look at. And the first is the, the penalty of sin. We're slaves to sin's penalty. Colossians 2 it talks about a code that is against us when we sin, right? When we sin, we are guilty. God's lists, his rules, his laws are against us, right? We've broken them. So now we're, we're, we're slaves to the penalty of sin, right? Second, we are slaves to sin's power. It's not just the penalty of sin that we're slaves to. It's the power it actually has over it. We can't stop sinning. We can't change on our own, right? And often with certain sins, you see it starts controlling a person. I, I have, unfortunately have some members in my family who are completely addicted to drugs. And I, I think drug addiction so accurately describes what sin looks like, right? It starts, uh, it starts as something that you maybe do for pleasure, right? Something because you want to. And then eventually it transforms, and it's now something you have to do. Right? There's not much choice anymore. You have to do it. We're slaves to its power. We can't change. We're also slaves to sin's presence in our lives. Sin is not just within us, right? Sin is an external force getting in as well, right? That we live in a sinful world, right? When you're cut off in traffic, when someone's mean to you, when someone rips you off, 
You know, we're all under the effects of sin in this world. Its presence is unavoidable. And Jesus also taught that the sin we have puts you in incredible debt. And Jesus uses the word debt in many of his parables to describe the effects of sin and what it has on us. When you fail to live for God and his commands, I imagine you become indebted. Like imagine God charges you like 10 bucks every time you sin, right? And you see over time, you are just so incredibly in debt, you could never pay it off, right? And obviously that's a very simplified and not so accurate way of describing sin. But we are so in debt to sin and we cannot possibly pay it off. It's like a credit card debt with like 20% interest, right? You can never actually pay that off. And on Judgment Day, when, when Christ appears again and we all stand before God having to give an account for our life, God is going to be calling his debt. He's going to be saying, hey, you owe me payment. You owe me debt. And none of us on our own are able to pay that price. And so we receive spiritual death as punishment, eternal separation from God. But here's the thing. Here's the blessing. God redeems you and frees you and forgives you from sin, meaning he has set you free from the penalty of sin, that you're not going to experience eternal death. He he has freed you from the power of sin, that it's not going to have a hold on you anymore. And he is... Uh, He has set you free from the presence of sin in your life, meaning that sin over time will, again, maybe slowly, become less and less in your life. And when we live in glory, it's going to be gone for good. He pays the debt for us. And how did God pay this debt? He did it in Christ, in Jesus' blood. And and, and you may ask, why did there need to be a a price, right? He's God. Couldn't he just snap his fingers, forgive us? But imagine this. Imagine I'm in your house, right? And I'm just running around and I knock over your lamp and your lamp breaks, right? You could forgive me for breaking your lamp, but that would mean paying the cost yourself. You would have to eat the cost of that broken lamp. And in the same way, that's what God does, right? He is willing to pay the price for our sin. But that means he now has to pay the cost we should have paid. And he pays that price through Jesus' death on the cross, right? Because Jesus is fully man and fully God, right? He has, a, he has infinite worth. He has infinite value, which means he can pay the infinite debt of our sin. He does this because of his love and grace for you. Just because he loves you. That's the blessing we have. We're now free from debt. We're free from the sin in our lives. And now lastly, the last blessing I want to look at, we also have the blessing of hope. And we see this in Ephesians 1. 9 to 14. Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the last blessing is now we have the blessing of hope. Now hope is a powerful thing. As some of you may know, I I work a lot with mental health and with people who are depressed and anxious. But one thing I see and one thing I work to try to help people get is hope, right? If you do not have hope, you will lack any ability to have resilience to the things of this world. In fact, there was a psychological study years ago with mice. Um, They Kind of a gross study, but they put mice in water and basically were seeing how long they could swim until they drowned. And with one group of mice, what they did is after a few minutes, they took them out of the water so that the mice knew they would get rescued after a certain amount of time. And then they all put those same mice back in water. And the mice who knew, who had hoped that someone might take them out, were able to swim, I think, like 200% longer than the mice who didn't think anyone would rescue them. So there's an actual like brain thing going on there. We need hope. And in Christ, we have all of the hope we could ever need. We have far greater hope than those poor mice ever did. God wants you to know 
that life is not a series of random, meaningless events. God is working to bring all things, all things in your life, all things in this world, towards an ultimate glorious end. Have you ever watched a movie where around the halfway point you were lost? And you are maybe wondering, like, how is this movie going to possibly bring all of these things together? All of these storylines, all of the, the bad things happening. And then at the end it does. And it's amazing and it's beautiful. And you see all of the things those characters had to go through was worth it because of the ending. That is what God's doing, but in an infinitely better way. All of the pain you've gone through in your life, all of the sorrows, God is doing something with it. And he's bringing all things towards their end. God's plan, when times have reached their fulfillment, is to bring all things together under Christ. And, and notice this. It, it, it's not just some things. It's all things. The universe is the scope of this. The universe. Everything will be under Christ. The word here, you know, bring things together, it's a rare Greek word that's only used one other time in Scripture. It means to sum up, right? Kind of everything. To bring something to a conclusion. And, and what means is that this provides an idea of what is and what will be. What will be, what we know will happen, the hope we look towards, is a perfect universe. A universe of harmony a universe of peace, a universe free from chaos, free from destruction, free from evil, free from pain, free from death. A universe where everything is right, everything is good. In other words, a universe under Jesus. And now in some degree, we're kind of witnessing some of these things already in the church, right? With Paul, with Ephesians, he's talking to Jewish Christians who were the first group to turn to Christ, but later non-Jews, non-Jewish non people, were also brought into the church to form a new community, right? And so you saw this new community transcended race, transcended culture, transformed, uh, transcended gender barriers, social barriers, all of those things. It was a perfect unity of different people under Jesus, right? And that same unity that's kind of depicted in the church, where all of us, though we come from different backgrounds, though outside of church, we might have like nothing in common. In here under Jesus, we have everything in common. We can call each other brothers and sisters because of our common relationship in Jesus Christ, right? That's just a small sample of what Jesus is going to do with the whole universe. He's going to bring it all under him. But our present universe, our present world, isn't under Christ yet. It's not fully under Christ yet, meaning things don't add up. This story has not concluded yet. Some things don't make sense to us. Our present world is filled with chaos, disorder, pain, suffering, death, unfairness, injustice, all of those things. And this isn't just true of the world, it's also kind of true of our lives too, right? Not every area of our lives right now is fully under Christ but it's becoming so. And this can cause us some heartache, right? And the mystery we, we are given here, right? The, whole, the blessing of hope is really assurance. Assurance we can have in this life when maybe things don't add up, when things don't make sense, when we're hurting, when we feel like things are unfair, where maybe we wonder where God is, we can have perfect assurance. We can have hope that the ending of this movie will make sense will have a good ending. And we see in, in verse 11, it reads, In him we have an, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the, uh, the counsel of his will. Notice whose work our assurance of hope is in. It's God's work. It's God's work. The certainty of our hope is not based in our own lives, it's not based in the work of others, and it's not based even in the work of the church. It's based in God's work. The certainty of your hope has to be based in Him, in His work, in Christ. The focus of, of all of Ephesians 1, and really the Bible as a whole, is God's work, not your work. God chose us. He predestined us. His will, His plan, His blessings. It's all about Him, not us. 
And I see many Christians <clears throat> who base their assurance on their own work or the work of other Christians or Christian leaders. What we call religious or moral performance. The blessings of God does not come into your life through your own work. They come through the work of Christ. In fact, in the first 12 verses of Ephesians 1, in Christ is used nine times. If Christ is the key then, how do I get him? How do I get Christ? How do I remain in Christ? And we see this in Ephesians 1.13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Meaning you heard the gospel, you heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ, you believed it, and you received the Holy Spirit in your life as a result of that belief. The certainty of your hope is backed up, is verified through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we see that Ephesians 1:13 and 14 talks about the sealing of the Holy Spirit, who is kind of the guarantor of our inheritance, right? Meaning that the presence of the Holy Spirit is God's promise. If you turn to Christ, God gives you the Holy Spirit, all of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is God's seal. A seal and a mark is a sign of ownership. Meaning, when you became a Christian, when you received the Holy Spirit, you are marked as God's. You are now His. And once you're His, nothing can ever take you out of that. The presence of the Holy Spirit is also God's guarantee. Think about it as a down payment, right? A sign of more things to come. That now the things that you have and are starting to have in the Holy Spirit, the blessings, the community, the peace, the hope, that those things are just a reflection of far greater things that are yet to come in Christ Jesus. Here's the good news then. As we detect the inner work of the Spirit in our lives, however small it may be, whether it's convicting you, guiding you, comforting you, you can rejoice because you have God's promise, you have His seal, you have His guarantee. So in conclusion, as we looked at those blessings, the blessing of adoption, the blessing of forgiveness, the blessing of hope, what can we do with all of that? What can we actually do with it? And I believe we need to have one major response that kind of transcends everything else, and that is worship. On hearing these things, the blessings we now have in Christ, adoption, forgiveness, hope, our primary response which should then last the rest of our lives into eternity, is worship of God. Worship of Him. That is our number one calling and our number one responsibility. Because it means we now center our lives on God. Worship does not just mean singing songs. It does not just mean coming to church on Sunday morning. It means our lives are now centered on God. Our lives are now about Him. That everything else our lives were centered on before, whether it's you know, fame, money, security, whatever, it's not on those things anymore. It's on Christ. It's on Him. And in fact, you, this, this joy is often shown so much in new Christians. When they start learning all of this stuff, when they start learning who they are in Christ, that they're forgiven, there's an excitement, there's a joy they have. And this joy should grow as we now live out these things, as our life is centered on God and His work, as we become more and more filled with the love of God, as we're now growing in our knowledge of God and sharing that with, other, with others, we now have more and more power to live for Him. But unfortunately, many Christians complain like they have no power. And I'm convinced the issue is an issue of worship. We're still focused on the wrong things. We're focusing on ourselves, our own work, our own lives, and not enough on God, not enough on His work. And so let's make a commitment this week. Out of these, this, this identity we have, out of the blessings we have through that identity, adoption, forgiveness, hope, let our response this week be worship to the King. Now what, what does this mean? It means in whatever you do this week, let it be out of your love for God. Let your lives be centered on Him. 
If you have to go to work and maybe do menial activities, do it out of your love for Christ. Do it as an offering for Him. If you are frustrated at another person, right, if they've wronged you, forgive them. Do that as worship to the King. Whatever you do, do it as worship. Center your lives on the King. And watch the transformation that happens. As you become more focused on Him and less focused on yourself, I promise you, you will be happier. You will feel these things more in your life. You will live out God's blessings more in your life. Living out the reality of His adoption, His forgiveness, the hope you now have. Because you're focused on Him and not yourself. Let's pray. Before we close our time in praise. Lord, we thank you for this morning. As we looked at the blessings we now have from our new identity, Lord, we have adoption. Lord, that you call us your kids and you're our Father. Lord, that can never be taken away. Lord, you've forgiven us. You've redeemed us. We were slaves. We were in debt. But now we're free in every way. And Lord, you have given us hope. Even when things in this life don't make sense, Lord, or are hard or are difficult, We can rejoice because we know how this will end. We know how our story ends, God, which is paradise, perfection, a perfected universe, Lord, where everything is righted, everything is good under you. We have that to look forward to, Lord, where we will live forever. Lord, we thank you. Lord, out of this good news that we would now live lives of worship, centering our lives on you, Lord, our hearts on you. And everything we do, Lord, we would do it as an act of worship to you. That we would be the hardest workers, because we're not doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for you. That we would be the most forgiving, the most loving. Because it's not about ourselves, Lord. We're doing it out of the love and forgiveness you have for us. Lord, that we would live differently than the world, because we are different. We're a new people. We're a new kingdom. Lord, we are children of God now. Let's live like children of God that we would go out with confidence, Lord, knowing you've accepted us, you love us, you forgive us. Lord, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. We thank you for this gift you've given us through your Son, Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone this morning who has not accepted this good news, Lord, who has not accepted you as King, Lord, who has not received the gospel message yet, Lord, believed it and received the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, that they would make that decision this morning. Lord, sitting on the fence is a decision. It's deciding not to follow you, Lord. It's deciding to to stay in the in-between. Lord, that there wouldn't be anyone like that this morning, Lord, that no one would leave like that, that we would be all in for you. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with me for our final song of praise.